Wars take place because of three reasons: honor, interest, and fear. In this case, what has happened with Putin? He has combined all three, uh, and it is not Putin who matters. If a future leader again combines these three factors, these three drivers, he will be inclined towards war. So, very warm welcome to all of you. Good evening, and uh, to this conversation uh, on making sense of the Russia-Ukraine war and what it means for the world. Uh, since the war started in on uh, February twenty fourth, uh, I'm guessing all of you uh, here have been kind of riveted to your screens, to poring over the newspaper articles and the commentary and the opinions and views that have. Uh, um, in this whole wall-to-wall -wall coverage uh, of, and people, and without re uh, with reason as well, but given the fact that this is perhaps, as some people describe, the biggest conventional military action since World War II, uh, more than just the military uh, action, the other fallouts and the uh, uh, of this, whether it's economic, whether it's uh, humanitarian, social, uh, and uh, and the geopolitics, uh, the implications it has for the world global order are staggering. Um, and it's very difficult sometimes to make sense of it all. And which is why we have two very fine minds with us um, uh, this evening. Um, and we're uh, very happy that um, Sandeep uh, Vaslekar has agreed to join this conversation. He's a familiar face for all Founding Fuel, uh, the community. Uh, welcome, Sandeep. Thank you. Yeah, so Sandeep, uh, as you know, is the president of Strategic Foresight, um, and um, he advises governments around the world. And I must tell you that uh, every year uh, we host these conversations around the world in 2021 and 2022. And for the last two years, a lot of our focus in founding fuel has been on the in US China. Uh, rivalry, which has really reshaped the, the, the world and geopolitics and the economics in, in very fundamental ways. But Sandeep has been one voice who's, I think, cons consistently talked about uh, the role of Russia and that we shouldn't keep them out of the equation. And I think today uh, it's, it's great that we have him back uh, in our midst. And I'm really also delighted to welcome Vivek Kelkar, who's a dear friend and a very seasoned journalist and researcher. We worked together at Business Standard many moons ago. Um, and he's currently um, uh, the co-editor and, um, and co-founder at the uh, Cosmopolitan Globalist, which is an international news uh, and current affairs magazine, online magazine. And they've been focusing on this issue. Obviously, this is one of the biggest stories of our times. Um, and he's, he's pretty well versed with the, um, the different contours of how this is unfolding. So without much ado, uh, I think we should jump in because we like to maximize the time that we get with, the, with two of our speakers. So over to you, Vivek, um, and uh, please take it away. Thank you, Indrajit. It's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, Sandeep and I, I think today we'll be discussing essentially three broad themes. Uh, I'm a student of history, so I like to go into the historical context and then there's, of course, the immediate context. We will look at some of the possible scenarios about what might happen next. Of course, it's very early days, so one can't speculate too much, but perhaps some very early trends can be drawn. And then, of course, there's the implications for what uh, the world might look at, the global world order. We're seeing signs of some very key economic fallouts already. Sandeep, of course, is uh, an expert on international relations, and he will be leading the conversation and uh, kind of lay out the contours for us on what might emerge. But what I will do, like I said, I love history. So I'm just going to kick off with a curious bit of history that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has tried his best to obfuscate. Uh, 
the medieval Kievan Rus state was distinct from Russia even in history. And even when the USSR was formed, Lenin formed the USSR as a free association of nations, a family of nations. He believed in this concept and he believed that the czars, the Romanov czars were too imperial and they were following a policy of russification of all the lands and all the nations that were there under their empire. So Ukraine, even after 1922, uh, was, and even through 1917 and 1918, was a distinct nation. It had a fairly, it had a fairly distinct identity and it had distinct historical trajectories. And what's even more interesting is that if you go back and look at the UN Charter in 1945, Ukraine is one of the original signatories to the charter as an independent country along with the USSR. So it's, it's a little misleading to deny its place in history, which is really what has happened today. And you know that's where the rhetoric seems to be going rather sadly. There's been a long history of independent movements within Ukraine, even in Soviet times, there were parties that sought to free Ukraine from the Soviet yoke, even under Stalin in the 1930s. And they have their own mythologies about quite a few of their leaders and the movements back then. And these date back even to recent history, like the 1980s. But coming to today, uh, much of the story possibly begins after the Soviet Union broke up in 1991. And uh, there was a host of treaties, agreements, some tacit conversations, uh, I believe when uh, 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 the unification of Germany happened. And there were all sorts of uh, uh, agreements that have led to what is today. Sandeep, would you agree? What, what are these significant events and what would you say are the turning points leading to today? Sandeep? Yes. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, in Kiev, there is a street called Andrishka Descent. Now, if you go to Andrishka descent on a Sunday morning, not now in the middle of the war, but earlier, you will find a large number of old men and women sitting in a row on the footpath. And what they are selling, they are selling the medals and the national emblems on the uniform of the soldiers that fought in the Second World War. And these were Ukrainian and Russian soldiers fighting together under Stalin's leadership against Hitler's soldiers. And so you find emblems, insignia, uh, and other stuff uh, from German, Ukrainian, Russian soldiers. And they are available for one euro or two euros. So once upon a time, these soldiers fought for these medals. They fought for the honor of their nations, which was represented in these medals. And this national honor, this national pride is today available for two euros on the streets of Kiev. So of all the people in the world, I would have thought that the Ukrainians and Russians would know better than anybody else in the world that the excessive national pride, the excessive obsession with your concept of nationhood and the excessive dependence on military is worth two euros 50 years down the line. And I thought that a visit to Andrzejewski descent, where a lot of Russian tourists you can find before this war, would teach some kind of a lesson and inspire some kind of inner search in the hearts and minds of Ukrainian and Russian people. 
and despite this andreski dissent and despite the sale of national honor for 2 euros 50 years after the war ukraine and russia have been engaged in very hostile relationship and have been on the brink of war for the last 10 years so ukraine became independent on the christmas day of december 1991 but the most significant event was in 1994 in 1994 vivek as you know ukraine signed an agreement with the united states and the soviet union or the russia russian federation which was later on endorsed by britain france and china to renounce its nuclear weapons in exchange for protection by us and russia initially and then britain france and china to protect ukraine's sovereignty ukraine's security and ukraine's territorial integrity thus ukraine is probably the only nation in the world whose sovereignty and security and territorial integrity is guaranteed by the five permanent members of the un security council in exchange for its renunciation of the nuclear weapons in 1997 russia and ukraine signed a bilateral protocol where russia gave additional guarantees to protect ukraine sovereignty and territorial integrity thus russia is a protector by law of ukraine sovereignty and this same protector is today undermining ukraine sovereignty and weakening and 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 uh, dismantling its territorial integrity so what russia is doing is not only violation of international law in general but it's also violation of the specific treaties that russia and ukraine have subscribed to so why did it happen actually after ukraine signed this pact with the five permanent members of the un security council ukraine had a wonderful opportunity to declare itself as a neutral state just like switzerland or austria instead of being caught up in the competition between the two intending empires the american empire and the russian empire and when leonid kuchma was the president of ukraine from 1994 about the time this treaty was signed until 2005 ukraine managed to have neutrality and ukraine managed to have good relations both with the americans and with the russians and also of course with the europeans but after kuchma stepped down in 2005 two leaders came up in ukraine viktor yushchenko and viktor yakunovich yanukovich now viktor yushchenko was very much on the side of the americans and viktor yanukovych was on the side of the russians so the skill with which leonid kuchma had managed a relationship with the two camps was lacking both in yushchenko and in yanukovych so when yushchenko became president in 2005 the pendulum swung towards the us and when Yanukovych became the president in 2010 the pendulum swung towards Russia but they couldn't keep relationship with both and Ukraine did not announce neutrality which was a golden opportunity for it all through the time so during Yushchenko's time in 2008 NATO declared its intention to make Ukraine a member and Ukraine also according to Russian aspersions announced its support for georgia in the russian georgian war of 2008 and this is where the modern conflict between russia and ukraine began in 2008 with nato's declaration of its intent to um, include ukraine in its membership and later on yushchenko was uh, he lost the power yanukovych came to power and he was supposed to sign an agreement with eu he resigned at that agreement and he got into establishing a special relationship with russia and so a large number of people in ukraine didn't like it and they overthrew yanukovych who was anyway also a very corrupt leader and there is a huge house outside of kiev that uh, yanukovych uh, owned which is now presented as a museum of corruption you can go there and you can see the bodies of lions and all kinds of horses and all kinds of other things there 
So once Yanukovych was thrown out, Russia thought that the majority of the Ukrainian people want to go on the American side, but only majority. There were still maybe 30, 35 percent in the east of Ukraine who wanted an alignment with Russia. And so Russians very systematically promoted insurgency in the eastern part of Ukraine, in, in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk regions, or together they are known as the Donbass region. So they started promoting insurgency, which took a very violent form. And in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea. Now, when Russia annexed Crimea, the United States, Britain, and France had an obligation under the 1994 treaty to protect Ukraine's sovereignty. So even though Russia was also a party to the same treaty, but Russia undermined its own treaty, what were the Americans doing? Because they had a 1994 obligation to, 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 to stop this kind of annexation. Um, Americans just uh, the, uh, imposed sanctions and criticized and protested, but they failed in fulfilling their obligation along with the Brits and the French to Ukraine what under the agreement of 1994. And Russia thought very good. The Americans are not ready to move. And so both the Russians and the Ukrainian government, successive Ukrainian governments in Kiev, sponsored rival militias in Donbas and a massive conflict erupted. Minsk agreements were signed to kind of find solutions to the conflict in Donbas. They were never implemented. So Minsk too lasted uh, just for a week, that ceasefire. Within a week, the, the ceasefire collapsed. And in the last eight years, since 2014 to 2022, almost uh, 14,000 people have been killed in this conflict in, in, in Ukraine. Now, when Zelensky became the president, he had an opportunity to declare Ukraine as a neutral state on the terms that Ukraine would join the European Union for its economic prosperity, but maybe not NATO, in order to keep away from military alliances. But he didn't do that. And the conflict increased. And it has finally now resulted in Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine in flagrant violation of international law, as well as the, the treaties between the two countries. Interesting you say that. Uh, Sandeep. Uh, the argument to counter that has been that, look, if Russia goes into Ukraine, anyway, they're going to be on NATO's borders anyway. Now, the question of there being a neutral state or, or not being a neutral state also arose because of the history of Russia, and, you know, the previous Soviet aggression with the um, uh, with Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Poland was feeling insecure around that time. Uh, and Romania, all these were, Romania and Poland were satellite states of the Soviet Union. And it was their insecurity in a way that led to them becoming members of NATO. And today we're in a situation where Ukraine has consistently felt insecure because even though they had these treaties with Russia, there were enough voices within Russia that often talked about, uh, uh, that regretted Ukraine's independence and didn't, and even Putin from right from uh, 1999, when he came to power, he has always looked like an aggressor and he's always looked like someone who had his eyes on the old Soviet empire. I mean, he's, he's gone into Chechnya, and then the annexation of Crimea was uh, particularly blatant. Yes, the US was silent through that, and that perhaps uh, de that definitely was a mistake. Uh, but I'm not quite clear about what options the US had at that point in time. And, uh, uh, you know, Russian aggression was always covertly feared by all the countries that surrounded them. And they did go into Georgia. They do control a large part of Georgia today, the Russians. 
So in one sense, wasn't the Ukrainian insecurity kind of justified? Well, well, I mean, all states on the border of Russian Federation have been feeling insecure, no doubt about that. And that's the reason why they want to be part of the Western Alliance. Also, they are not any great admirers of the Russian economic model, not the Soviet model, but the post-Soviet Russian model, which is just a, a oligopoly and a kleptocracy where mm -hmm. only a bunch of uh, people connected with the establishment are getting rich and a lot of the population is poor. And that's why everybody in Ukraine wanted to join uh, uh, and want to join the, the European Union as much as uh, many of the former Soviet republics as well as Soviet uh, 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 allies want to join European Union for economic reasons. No, insecurity, insecurity was, was, was uh, there. It was justified. Russia's own track record of first attacking Chechnya, then attacking Georgia, uh, always the, well, created the question, raised the question, what next? Who's going to be the next on the, on the Russian platter? But on the other hand, when Leonid Kuchma was president for 10 years, he managed to balance uh, both Russians and the Americans. That is a fact. And Switzerland had enough reasons to be to be insecure in the last 200 years. It was there in the middle of two world wars, but it managed neutrality. Austria has had enough reasons to be insecure. It's a, again a state uh, located in a very, uh, at a very geostrategic uh, space, uh, but it managed insecurity. And most, most important, Finland, which is on the border of uh, Russia, has managed effective insecurity while being part of the West. So, uh, Ukraine could have possibly followed the Finland model of being part of the West and still having a neutrality uh, uh, overall uh, uh, on the, some kind of a combination of Swiss, Austrian, Austrian, Finland model. But anyway, that is history. Now that time is gone. Ukraine could have done this in the last 20 years. It hasn't happened. Today it's not going to happen. Tomorrow it's not going to happen because now Russia has proven that it's not worthy of trust. So if we talk about Ukraine's potential neutrality, it's only now a historical and academic debate. It's not a debate for today and tomorrow. So the question is, now what next? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, 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 and here, I think almost nobody in the world knows what uh, Putin has in his mind. I mean, here is a person who is playing cards very close to his chest. We wonder whether anybody in Kremlin also knows what he has in mind. Leave aside uh, anybody outside of Russia. And we don't know what is his end game. The stated end game, uh, not by Kremlin, but by many Russian experts, is demilitarization of Ukraine, which is not going to happen. It's just unrealistic. So what else is the end game? We don't know. And so since we don't know the end game, we don't know how long this war is going to last and uh, whether it is going to be a matter of weeks or matter of months or even matter of years. There are wars which have lasted for years. I mean, the two world wars went on for five years at the cost of total destruction of the participating countries. We had Iraq-Iran war, which went on for 10 years. You have a war of sorts going on in Afghanistan for uh, decades uh, through various regimes. So we don't know how long this war is going to last. Today, the media is covering it day by day, hour by hour. But if it goes on for months, media is not going to give the attention it is giving today. Uh, and if it, if it goes on for years, then obviously it's going to be forgotten uh, from the mainstream media in the world. And, 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 and the war itself might continue. So we simply don't know how long the war is going to last what impact it will have on Ukraine internally, what impact it will have on Russia internally, because today we are seeing some signs of protest in Russia, despite the autocracy and despite uh, the, the authoritarian nature of the regime and all the fears it invokes. But still there have been protests in St. Petersburg and in Moscow and other cities uh, against the war. So uh, we don't know to what extent they represent a public discontent, whether it is just suppressed or whether it is going to explode uh, at some stage. 
so there are so many so many questions which which we cannot really answer about the outcome of the war itself but the but the outcome of the war or not uh this actually spells out a completely new era in the kind of institutional arrangements that are going to happen across the world both the economic institutional arrangements and the military institutional arrangements we have seen a strengthening of nato from a time when it looked like it was going to break up and people were 3 years ago people who actually questioning i was among those who was questioning the relevance of nato to the modern format uh but here's here's a situation where nato is showing an amazing amount of unity the european union is showing a uh, amazing amount of unity uh britain is not looking like it's exactly savvy in having done brexit a few years ago georgia and moldova have applied to become members of the eu moldova mind you is a part of the russia led commonwealth of industrial a uh, commonwealth of independent states georgia and ukraine have applied they are for, former members of the cis and uh, uh, it looks like there will be completely new institutional arrangements going forward where do you see the us figuring in all this where do you see the eu figuring in all this what kind of institutional arrangements can we uh, kind of anticipate going forward well there is we have absolutely no doubt that the united states tried to provoke ukraine as much as the russians tried to provoke constituents in ukraine to be hostile to the other side for last 10 years so that shows that that united states does have an interest in trying to un- incorporate ukraine in its in its world but looking beyond ukraine and i mean i don't know what is going to be left of ukraine if this war goes on for several months uh, in terms of the modern civilization um, in fact uh, today somebody called me uh, which was quite interesting i wasn't aware that there are several heritage sites in ukraine and they were wondering whether these heritage sites would be protected or whether these heritage sites would be would be, would be demolished and uh, we know in the in the bosnian war the libraries and museums were deliberately bombarded by by serbians and if the russians would go to the level of the afghan taliban and deliberately uh, destroy the heritage sites uh, they have already declared their intent to destroy the industrial capacity and and the energy capacity of ukraine but so we don't know how far the onslaught will be whether it will be on culture on history uh, on symbols on civilian population we have to see uh, but uh, outside of ukraine uh, nato is going to go as far as it can it's already declared its intent it is now in fact can uh, in a position to provide lot of incentives for ukraine even to join nato soon rather than being wavering if ukraine comes out of this okay uh, out of this war we don't know w- w- what's going to happen but even if not ukraine nato is going to going to uh, uh, expand up to the borders of ukraine it is going to go an extra furlong to uh, look at and protect the three baltic states mm-hmm. estonia latvia and Lat- uh, lithuania because the general fear is that if the russians get their way in ukraine the next target will be estonia or or latvia or lithuania now if they get into estonia latvia lithuania the baltic states then we could even be looking at the possibility of a nuclear war but there will be lot of lot of attention being given to the baltic states if if ukraine falls to to putin's uh, ambitions and that would be very significant uh, uh, okay. european union may want to include some of the states including moldova and ukraine and others but european union is the slowest bureaucracy in the world as you know and they have their own procedures and they may make a declaration of political intent but 
for their bureaucracy to follow and actually include some of these other countries into their into their uh, fold is a different ball game altogether so unless the politics totally overrides economics and bureaucracy and everything it's going to be years or decades before any of these states can become uh, members of the, uh, the european union uh, finally european union is an economic project originally it was meant to be a political project but more and more it's become a economic economic project and a, and a, and a bureaucratic uh, project so uh, european union can get into special relationships actually it does have special relationship also with the current ukraine it can get into special relationship with other states on the border but in terms of its formal expansion uh, it's uh, it's it's very difficult to uh, uh, envisage european union actually expanding what will happen if you really look take a very long term perspective one of the most significant development that took place in the last week since russia attack ukraine or that germany decided to rearm itself mm -hmm. this is very significant not only in the context of uh, russia's invasion of ukraine but it is extremely significant for the conduct of international relations and the flow of international relations in the next few decades germany had more or less frozen its military expenditure since 1980s when trump was president he forced germany to increase its military expenditure and germany in increased it reluctantly by a couple of billion dollars uh, but now germany has voluntarily on its own announced a decision to rearm itself and it will not uh, uh, stop at the minimum possible expenditure it will cross 2% of the gdp uh, target for for uh, for its military expenditure and this is a te decision taken by a newly formed government of socialist and green parties i mean socialist and green parties are supposed to be the most pacific parties in 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 germany or in europe and they are the ones who have taken a decision to rearm uh, germany and mind you the the foreign minister is a green foreign minister annalena brabeck so uh, germany's decision to rearm is going to be very significant in the next 10 to 15 years and japan also there is a debate started in in japan whether they should station nuclear weapons and germany today is talking about rearming in the civilian terms who knows in 10 years from now if germany starts talking about uh, uh, having its own nuclear weapons so this war might have just triggered a trajectory with german and and and, and japanese militarization and potential nuclearization and maybe in 2039 you might have a situation like 1939 where germany and japan were very strong militarily aggressive nations and the same thing could happen in 2039 with germany and japan again being very uh, aggressive triggered by this war uh, or or enabled by this war so so the eu and and the western alliance will be slowly dominated by germany or a german franco alliance i think the french will follow up with 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 germany but we don't know and this is the subject we'll discuss in a short while how germany is going to manage its industrialization if it is going to be having a hostile relationship with russia and going to depend on russia for its natural gas so but that's something that we we need to come back uh, to so in terms of institutionalization briefly we see expansion of the west to the teeth we see political rhetoric of eu expanding but actually not doing it unless except by special arrangements and on the other hand russia also solidifying its relationship with china and whoever else they can in the middle east and here and there so what we are going to look at is is really polarization of the of the world and uh, in a, in a kind of a bipolar world uh, more than a multipolar world and so that's curious because you talk about china now china has been playing it very cagey over the last uh, couple of weeks they abstained from the un resolution that was supported by 141 members historically it's tended to stay away from conflicts uh but 
of course, what are China's stakes in the game that Russia has played? How do you see China figure into this mix now and going forward? Because let's not forget that there's a huge amount of economic connections that have been formed over the last couple of years, last few years between uh, Russia and China. And increasingly in time, uh, like we analyze at the Cosmopolitan Globalist, it's likely that uh, uh, Russia is going to be economically dependent on China rather than uh, the other way around. Uh, and that's not something that's going to be comfortable for the Kremlin either. They're going to be dependent on gas the, because they're going to have, they're building all these pipelines and new pipelines. Even the old power, power of Siberia pipeline, which was launched a uh, uh, short while ago, uh, it had to be completed with Russian money, with Chinese money. The Russian company didn't have, Rosneft didn't have the money to complete that pipeline. And increasingly, there's been all these uh, deals that are being signed. And just last week in the middle of the war, they signed up the deal for the power of Siberia 2 or uh, the Soyuz Vostok pipeline, as they call it. So there's, there's China is in a very curious position here. And China is also playing its cards very uh, uh, close to its chest. So what, what, how do you see, do you see any overt moves by China to bail Russia out of what might be an imminent financial crisis? That's the immediate question. And long-term or medium to long-term, the question really is, where does the Russia-China alliance really go? What are the options? What's their game? Well, Vivek, uh, Russia and China are going to be mutually dependent, not just Russia dependent on China. Russia is, is, is dependent on China in terms of hard cash and economic resources. But China is dependent on Russia on, on uh, gas, natural resources. But more so, if you take a longer term view, China is going to seek a lot of cooperation from Russia for its water resources. Chinese and Russians are already involved in uh, 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 negotiations for diverting some of the Russian rivers uh, to China. China has serious uh, environmental and water, pro water problems, which will have implications for food production in the longer term. With climate change, and Arctic warming, Russia will have surplus of water. And Russia can convert some of this water into what is called virtual water or food production. And China will depend on Russia for, for import of food grains. Uh, in fact, Russia will become a major agricultural power in the long term, in, in 10 to 15 years because of global warming and, 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 and the rivers which are flowing there. And, and, and the fertility of land in many parts of Russia. So they might be exporting uh, food grains on a large scale to the world, but particularly to China. So China will depend on, on Russia for natural gas, for, uh, for uh, 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 water, indirectly food, uh, and uh, uh, also, Arctic. Arctic has massive resources, including both energy and water and, and transport. So China is cooperating closely with Russia. I mean, Russian-Chinese alliance in Arctic is all but announced. Mm -hmm. And just as they talk about uh, horizontal uh, uh, belt road, they talk about a vertical belt road or a vertical sea road from Arctic to China, which is jointly to be managed by Russian and, 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 and Chinese cooperation. Absolutely. China and Russia are also cooperating in space. Now, the current International Space Station, uh, which is the US-Russian cooperation, and we have to see what happens to that after this conflict. Uh, and, and, and let me come back to US in a second, but to continue with China. Uh, so, so that space station is going to be downed anyway by 2030. And there will be no International Space Station in the space except the one owned by the Chinese. The only American space stations which will be launched 
will be the one uh, owned by uh, Bezos and maybe Elon Musk. So this will be private space stations, which will be more used as a platforms to to carry stuff to other planets and for outer space activities. But a serious space station is is there only one at the moment, uh, which is going to be there for a long time, uh, which is the Chinese space station. And Chinese have already declared that they want to operate it in cooperation with Russia, but under the Chinese leadership. And this has been already settled. So the Chinese-Russian cooperation goes way beyond uh, financial uh, uh, management uh, and financing of the Russian projects. It's uh, the, it's energy, water, food, Arctic, space, uh, and, and what have you. And so because of this, even though there are certain reasons for tension between China and Russia, we will see China and Russia coming together uh, in a very pragmatic way. Uh, and both leaderships are very ruthless and they're very cold-blooded. Uh, not only the current leaderships of Putin and Xi Jinping, but overall, if you look historically uh, at the Chinese and Russian leaderships, except for a few gaps here, there, like in the time of Yeltsin, they have always had ruthless leaderships uh, and, and, and very heartless leaderships. And they will always make very cold calculations, uh, suppress uh, small problems, and they will forge an alliance. So in the long run, we can see a China, China, uh, uh, Russia alliance coming and whether China is superseding Russia or Russia is superseding China doesn't really matter all that much. The cooperation will be very much. And plus, they will carve out some interest sections in the Middle East. Iran would happily go with them. And uh, some of the other countries in the Middle East, they will try to try to co-opt. Uh, so, uh, so China-Russia cooperation is something that's, uh, that's definitely going to happen. And if that cooperation, the closer that cooperation is, the more the nature of the world will be bipolar. If that cooperation is less, and if they have uh, insist on their independence, uh, uh, strategic independence, strategic autonomy, a lot more than, than that is warranted by the resource politics, then the world will be multipolar. With Chinese providing one pole, Russia providing one pole, and the, and the West providing one pole. So we don't know exactly how it is going to play out, but definitely there is going to be an alliance of strategic nature. If it becomes tactical, if it becomes diluted, then we will have a multipolar world. This brings us to the question of economics, really, because uh, you, when you talk about the Russia-China alliance, it's impossible to divorce the economic angle from that, as you pointed out. And Russia, multipolar world, the question then comes up is, will Russia be a significant economic power in the years uh, that are to come? And now with the sanctions taking effect, it's going to be even more of a double whammy on Russia, uh, literally starting from now. The clock has started ticking down already. So uh, what's, uh, where do you see the economic situation go now? And what do you say would be the big risks from the crisis both for the world and uh, for Russia itself. Well, let me ask you, what are you hearing about the natural gas flow? Because the last I heard was the gas was still flowing from Russia to Germany as of yesterday. But I could be wrong. Uh, no, the but gas you are is still working flowing. with cosmopolitan globalist uh, magazine centered in Europe. You might have better information. The gas is flowing. There's been intermittent flows. At some point in time, there was a story from Reuters last night saying that the flows had reduced. This morning, there was a story saying that the flows were back. And then about uh, six o'clock in the evening, I saw a story saying that the flows have reduced again. Uh, whether it's completely normal, I don't know. One of our uh, participants here, Srinivasan, says that there's a normal flow. Uh, but I'm not absolutely sure whether the flow is completely normal. And there seems to be some questions about whether Russia can use that economically as a lever without hurting itself. But having said that, then the whole question of sanctions comes up. 
there was a whole question of sanctions which comes up and uh, how are the payments for the current oil contracts, oil, the gas contracts going to be effectively uh, made? And then there you are, you know, getting into corporate this thing, you have the entire question about how the companies are going to manage in the short term. Uh, they definitely can't access the capital markets. So whether it's for short term uh, borrowings or medium term borrowings, there's going to be a huge impact out there. So these questions are still open. Uh, there's a certain amount of Russian money that's still in the trade finance system and which we expect will be there for some time. That is what we're saying in the Cosmopolitan Globalist. Uh, we had one of our uh, specialists, Paul Davis from Australia, uh, who wrote about this uh, two days ago. Uh, this is what we expect. But then at the same time, like you point out, there's altogether too many balls in the air to predict sharply what might happen uh, on the economic front. But nevertheless, it does look like Russia is going to be hamstrung. And a lot of, uh, if Russia is very severely hamstrung, then the question comes up about what might happen to a whole lot of areas where Russia is uh, uh, quite strong. You talked about food. Now, Russia is a very, very significant player in fertilizers. And fertilizers are transported through the sea. So whether it's ammonia, urea, phosphates, uh, all those for potash, Russia is a very significant player in that. And also the natural gas strength gives them a huge uh, advantage in fertilizers. So how is that going to go out? How are the ships going to come out from the Black Sea or uh, uh, at this moment? Because I believe Turkey is also closing the straits, the uh, Marmara Straits and the, uh, the Marmara Sea and the Dardanelles Straits. So there's questions on the Black Sea exports. There's uh, questions about what, uh, how payments are going to be done in future, even for things like fertilizers. Now, I worked in the fertilizers industry for eight years, so that's something that I track as a matter of interest. And that's, that's, there's really questions up in the air now. So that's going to impact uh, mind you, uh, Russia is also a big importer of seeds. Of seeds. Okay. And if it can't import the seeds it requires for this sowing season, uh, even some of their wheat exports are going to be constrained. Uh, uh, the sowing season is just about a month or two from now. Spring in April is when really the sowing would start. But it's, uh, uh, these are just questions that are up in the air. One doesn't know where it's going to go because the sanctions are going to affect all of these things. Rick, I'll have to just cut in here because we're uh, a little conscious of the time. So there are many questions as well, which both of you can also take on and build from here. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, try and kind of cluster them uh, if that's okay, because there are some questions around arising from the conversation both of you had on Russia and China, right? I think Srini, Charles and Sunit have a question which, are, which is kind of related to the India position. Uh, if, India, uh, if Russia and China become powerful partners, mutually dependent, uh, what impact will that have on India? Uh, how should India think about its position? And in the current context, we have abstained from I think three uh, different UN resolutions. Um, what should we be doing? Should we retain our neutrality? Or, I mean, that's a question that's increasingly being asked um, uh, here. Um, and are we going to put ourselves into a corner and suffer the consequences of US sanctions? I mean, there's some talk of that as well. But uh, if would uh, maybe. Uh, I'm curious. I really want to know Sandeep's view on this because. Uh, when was it in December when uh, Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Putin had that virtual conference? 
they came out of that and Putin made the statement like almost like he was willing to play a, a central role in the Russia China crisis. So uh, he made those curious statements and those statements seem to have been fairly well received in Delhi. Uh, and uh, those statements are significant from an Indian point of view because they, they actually bring to play what India has been doing now, abstaining from an issue which might have longer term repercussions on India itself. That's Sandeep. Well, I think we'll keep aside the UN resolutions for a moment. I'll come back to them, but we'll just keep them on hold. As far as the, the strategic content of uh, Russia-China relations and its uh, implications for India, uh, one thing that you can easily foresee and you don't need to be an expert is that if there is a, there is a China-India conflict of a serious nature, Russia will try to play a mediator's role and try to become a like a uh, 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 peacemaker between the two because Russia cannot afford to lose China, but it cannot afford to lose India also. With many of its economic options closing, uh, I mean, what are the Russia's two biggest exports? One is the natural gas, and, and second is the agriculture, and, and, and the third, and fertilizers, everything related to agriculture, and the third is defense. And India is a big market for Russia. And this is, again, a mutually dependent relationship. Russia needs India for as a market, and India needs Russia for its uh, maintenance of the defense equipment, uh, uh, spares, uh, personnel, so many things uh, that we need. So Russia cannot just uh, forget about India. Russia is getting into embrace with the Chinese panda. So if there is a tension between China and India, maybe Russia doesn't interfere, but if the tension uh, gets into conflict, uh, Russia may try to see if it can play a re re mediatory role. And I think New Delhi expects that. Uh, I think despite all our bravado, uh, the people in South Bloc know that we are weak with regards to China. We won't like to say that none of the television stations, uh, channels will agree with this because they think we are the Vishwa Guru and we are the biggest power, much bigger power than Russia, China and America put together. Uh, that is the view on our nine o'clock television channels. But uh, the South Block is more nuanced. They know the realities and they want to have uh, options open for uh, preventing and resolving conflicts, major conflicts, so that India can continue on the path of economic development and meet the very massive social and economic challenges uh, within the country. Would the US now, coming at to all the try UN, to... You know, basically, there is a fundamental question that, that the world has to answer, including India and all other countries. And we also have to answer. See, first of all, it's not, it's not the first major invasion in recent times. Russia itself, we have said this before, has attacked Chechnya, has attacked uh, Georgia, to say the least. US has attacked uh, Iraq. Is US has attacked Syria, Libya for you know very flimsy reasons. I'm not talking about Afghanistan at all, which is a little complicated. Serbia has attacked Bosnia Herzegovina and squeezed its neck for three years and uh, treated the Bosniaks in a very inhuman way. NATO has attacked Serbia. So attacking other countries is a common game. It is not, there is no long piece that Steven Pinker and others claim. Just these invasions prove. And I'm only talking about the invasions involving US and Russia. There have been so many invasions uh, involving African countries or uh, 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 in other parts of the world. But just in Europe itself or in the Middle East, led by US and Russia, there have been lots of invasions. And the world has accepted these invasions. I don't honestly know, I mean, I claim ignorance when, as India is pleading uh, neutrality in the case of Russian invasion of, invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine, 
I don't remember what was India's stand when America invaded Iraq. Whether India was on the side of the side of the invader, or whether India was on the side of the victim, or whether India was on the uh, in a neutral position, I don't recall honestly what India did at that time. So, uh, so now we are talking about India's neutrality in this particular conflict. But what did India do when earlier invasions took place? So the basic question that India has to answer and the world has to answer looking at the number of invasions which have been taking place, is this. Do we want a world which is governed by principles or do we want a world which is governed by politics and power? If we want a world which is governed by principles, be they moral principles uh, coded in the UN Charter or otherwise, then you have to make every possible effort to come together as an international community to stop invasions. And it's not a question of choosing between Russia and Ukraine. It's a question of choosing between politics of principles and politics of power. Mm -hmm. If we oppose and criticize this invasion, we should do it not because what it means for Russia or the US, but because what it means for the principles on which international law should be upheld. And therefore, uh, if we want, as a country, as a nation, if we think we are civilized and we want a principled uh, conduct of international relations, we should oppose it. If we want uh, a world which is purely driven by power politics, then you can be on whichever side you want. When it suits you, be on the side of invader. When it suits you, be on the side of victim. And when it suits you, pretend to be neutral. So it's for the elite in the capital to decide as to what is their moral standing, what is their uh, their, their, their moral stake. Uh, so if they are on a morally high ground, they will go one way. If they are mor morally low ground, they will go another way and they'll find hundreds of justifications to do that. And this is not only for the elite in Delhi, this is also for the elite in uh, 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 Slovenian capital, in Ljubljana, in... Uh, 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 Abe Kuta in uh, London, in Paris, in Washington. And that really is the question that humanity is facing. And maybe if the Russian invasion of, uh, of uh, uh, Ukraine raises this fundamental question about the governance of international politics, we would say something would be achieved in the long run. So in one from, sense, it's almost a 1945 moment again. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. But I want to say one thing in conclusion. I started uh, my remarks uh, drawing our attention to the Andrzejewski descent in Ukraine, in, in Kiev, where the medals of the 1944 war are today available for two euros. And I want to make a prediction that in another 10 years or even five years, uh, if you go to Kiev and if you go to Andrzejewski descent, you will find the medals won in the 2022 war between Ukraine and Russia will be available for two euros. That is the value of hypernationalism. That will be revealed five years from now, ten years from now, and I hope uh, the sense will prevail. In the meanwhile, we have to see what's the outcome of the, uh, the story. We have to see how Russia Russia uh, comes out. If Russia remains a strong state, whether it's Putin or or, or anybody else, I'm not really driven by personalities. Uh, it, states are not run by by personalities. States are run by con, uh, you know combination of factors. So even if Putin may not be there, somebody else might be there. And if it's uh, uh, driven by similar kind of uh, 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 tripods that uh, Thucydides presented in 500 BC and Hobbes repeated in the 17th century that wars take place because of three reasons. Honor, interest, and fear. In this case, what has happened with Putin, he has combined all three. Uh, and it is not Putin who matters. If a future leader again combines these three factors, these three drivers, he will be inclined towards war. And if Russia remains strong, 
Ukraine will have no option but to find some kind of compromise and neutrality. If Russia becomes weak, it will be a different state altogether. So we are too early in the game to make any predictions, except the one that the medals on the uniforms of Ukrainian and soldiers and, and the Russian soldiers will be available for two euros on Andrashki descent. So go to Kiev five years from now and buy them. Thank you.